to really celebrate the work that George Gale did, not only in the myriad ways in his profession as an attorney and founding Galesville, but also his um, work that he did to document the native cultures who were here. Um, Ernie and I have been doing archaeology in the Driftless area um, for, for many decades, and so I just want to kind of start by showing where we are in the world and up to the northern part of what is now Wisconsin but never entered this area and as a result we have this beautiful topography our steep bluffs and deeply carved valleys um, so Galesville is here here's Beaver Creek coming into the Black River it's the the main Wisconsin bluff line and then the Mississippi River um, is about five miles off and here are the Trempolo Bluffs and here's Trempolo Mountain at one point the Trempolo Bluffs were actually connected to the, the main Wisconsin woodland culture, so the, this, this time period between 2,000 and 1,000 years ago. But I just want to start out by pointing out that in the Galesville we've been here for 13,000 years. We know that because we've been doing you know, archaeology and, and many, many before us have done archaeology for, for many years to kind of document the, the native people who were here going back 13,000 years. And what we have identified is a series of different cultural ways that people are living through time. We call these cultural traditions. So there's the Paleo-Indian. These are the first people who were here 13,000 years ago when the glaciers were retreating. People were hunting megafauna, mammoths and mastodons. We find their bones. And actually, I'll show you a few pictures of, of some examples of those. People are using what's called a Clovis spear point um, to hunt these, these huge animals. Um, when, when they become extinct, what happens is lots of changes are, are occurring. Megafauna become extinct, bison come in, deer and elk come into this region, and the climate changes, gets warmer and drier. And as a result, what you see is changes in the ways that people are making their stone tools and making all their material culture changes as a result of their environmental changes. They adapt and they invent new ways of making objects just like we do today. Um, and so following the Paleo-Indian tradition, we call this the archaic tradition, the very, very long period of time. Then the woodland era, which is when people begin to build mounds for the first time. The bow and arrow comes in for the first time. People are making earthen pottery, <coughs> gardening, and then later farming. Um, and then by about the 1600s, the first European explorers come through this region. So a couple of interesting local finds. Paleo Indian. One is, is this mastodon pelvis bone that was found on the Sabota farm in the 1950s. This is up by Arcadia. Here's a picture. Um, these Clovis points, again, these are 13,000 year old points found in your Centerville, made out of a kind of flint called Cochrane Chert. You probably are familiar with Cochrane, just up the river Cochrane Mountain City. That's where it gets its name. This is a, what we call a Thebes point, an archaic point from German Cooley near Ettrick. This is made out of a, what's called the Hickston Silicified Sandstone. We're going to come back to that because George Gale was really influential in helping to document Silver Mount, this place near Hickston, Wisconsin, up by Black River Falls, that this flint comes from, or this silicified sandstone comes from. By 2,500 years ago, we're into the beginning of what we call the woodland culture. And there's um, some really amazing things happening here. Archaeologists call this the Hopewell, the Hopewell culture. And what happens is that people begin to build huge dome-shaped round mounds on the landscape. And in those mounds, we find the burials of humans along with these incredible grave goods that come from all over the United States. So I'll give you an example. You get copper from Lake Superior, silver from Canada coming into the burials um, in Wisconsin. You get cut mica from the Appalachians, marine shell bead coming from the Gulf of Mexico being placed into burial mounds of people in Wisconsin. It's, it's really incredible. You get flints like obsidian coming from the Rocky Mountains. There's a huge trade network going on um, about 2,500 years ago that lots of people are um, a part of. 
And we see that. We see that right around the Trumpelow area. So in 1928, Will McKern and many others, his crew, came from the Milwaukee Public Museum, and they excavated the Nichols Mound. Are you all familiar with the Nichols Mound on the bike trail near Trumpelow? This is a Hopewell Mound, a big, you can see how, how big it actually is. Um, what they did is they actually cut with horses. They took a team through the center and they trenched through the center. And they came down on, um, this is the, the roof, a birch bark roof of a building. So the way these mounds were built is actually before the mound is built, woodland people, the Hopewell people, are building like a rectangular building that's like a mausoleum. That's where people are interred when they pass away. So people are laid to rest in that building with incredible great woods. These are some of the ones that came out of the Nichols Mound. So this is, for example, this is an obsidian um, flint knife from you know, Yellowstone National Park. Just incredible amounts of, of just beautiful. Some of these are like two feet tall. Um, we have a pipe and a pot. This is a copper breastplate that they found um, with some fabric still attached. Um, but essentially what happens is when the mausoleum is full of people and they can no longer fit any other people inside, they build a mound over the top. And then what happened is the roof of that building collapsed. So when the Milwaukee Public Museum came here and they opened this up, they could actually peel back layers of time and actually see the whole collapse of the building and then all of the, the people buried inside of all the great bits. It's really an impressive um, Site. By a thousand years ago, Native people quit building the round mounds and they, they start building what are called effigy mounds. These are earthen mounds in the shapes of animals. And there are tons of effigy mounds and many that are lost now, but all around Galesville. We're going to tell you about them in just a minute. The whole southern half of Wisconsin was inhabited by these effigy mound builders. And essentially what these are, these are, we call them spirits of the earth. They represent the worldview of the people who made them. So this upper world, sky clan types of mounds, you get birds and, and geese. Middle world or earth world spirits, bears and deer. And then underworld spirits, which are long-tailed panther or turtle mounds is what we call them. So not only are these mounds places to bury the dead, they also mark territories. They are the embodiment of their spiritual ideology. Um, and they also probably mark the beginnings of different clan groups, like the ho chunk still have a clan structure in the Hoda Sioux, um, who are descendant communities of the Effigy Mound builders. A couple of other things about the Effigy Mound culture, they're living in wigwam-like type houses. They are practicing what we call a seasonal round. So big groups congregating together, like along the Black River, Beaver Creek, and the uh, Mississippi River in the summer months because it's full of food and it can support a lot of people. Mound building is happening in the summer months. And then in the winter, really to make it through a Wisconsin winter a thousand years ago, they're dispersed into smaller family groups, into interior valleys, into rock shelters, and relied on hunting deer to make it through a winter. And then they would congregate together in larger villages in the summer months. The bow and arrow comes in for the first time about 1,300 years ago. Up until that point, they're hunting with handful spears. And this is an example of just little tiny arrowheads. If any of you are artifact collectors, I'm sure your collections are full of these because they are very ubiquitous in farmland um, in this area. Okay, at the same time, effigy mound builders are living in this part of the world, southern Wisconsin. A big city is developing called Cahokia down near St. Louis, Missouri. So anywhere from 10 to 30,000 people were living at Cahokia. At the same time, the effigy mound builders are living in this area. Cahokia, just to give you an idea, at a thousand years ago was bigger than London. It's a huge place. Lots of people living here that lived in a stratified society. So the elite leaders lived on top of these platform mounds 
Um, so instead of building effigy mounds, Mississippian people build these flat top rectangular mounds. This is Monk's Mound. This is the largest mound at Cahokia. If you've been to Camp Randall, Monk's Mound would fill Camp Randall. It's 100 feet tall. It's 15 acres at its base. It's made by simply piling basket loads, millions of basket loads of earth. And the purpose of which is to put that elite leader's house on top of. Okay. Mississippians are also large scale farmers. Um, they have very distinctive kinds of artifacts that are totally different styles than what the Aboriginal what the <coughs> builders are using up here. Their language is, is different than what Aboriginal people are presumably speaking. And even their house styles are really different. They're rectangular and they're thatched roofs. So if you've ever been to Belize or Central America, Mayan people are still living in, in houses like this. Ernie and I have been studying for almost 20 years now um, in Trampolo about Mississippian people leaving their homeland of Cahokia near St. Louis and coming 530 miles up the Mississippi, up the Mississippi River, not down. Not many people come up the river in a canoe, but these Mississippian people came, left their homeland of Cahokia, came up the Mississippi River to Trampolo about a thousand years ago when Effigy Mound people were living in and around this area. We've done lots of excavations um, in, in using, yeah, uh, you know, including having local uh, members of the community work with us, students from the university. We found lots of Mississippian artifacts. This is an edge of a rectangular house. Um, again, Mississippians build rectangular houses. And then we've documented um, a series of platform mounds on Little Wolf in Trumpelo. And we'll tell you a little bit more about this um, at, towards the end of the presentation. By the way, this is a map made in 1884 by a mound surveyor called T.H. Lewis, who's a really important character in our story here. I think I pass it to you now. Good. All right, so we're going to do tag team here. Oh, more people came. Um, <laughs> Uh, so there's a lot of chairs up here. There, there's more chairs up if you want. Good, good. All right, he's eating already. <laughs> All right. So while the Mississippians are at Trumpelo, where the star is, um, there's effigy mount people all around this area, not right in Trumpelo, but there's effigy mount groups represented by all these triangles. So each of those triangles represents a documented effigy mount group. So each group has maybe up to 50 mounds or so, animal shaped mounds. So, effigy mounds all around this area. Here's Old Main uh, that I'll talk about in a little bit. But I'm going to start with talking about a mound group at Decorah Prairie and what happened to that through time. So, oh, wrong way. Here we go. Okay. So, uh, the first record of effigy mounds in this area is when the government land office surveyors came through in the 1840s. And when they came across the section line in Decorah Prairie, these guys rarely documented Native American remains, mounds and things like that, but once in a while they did. This guy, John Freeman, actually did. So he wrote, here is a level plate containing numerous remains of ancient works, some distinct uh, remains of fortification embankments with gateways and numerous mounds of an elevation from three to five to six feet, tumuli in imitation of horses, deer, or antelope, some you know, standing, others running, uh, attitude, one resembling a crocodile or a lizard that's 190 feet in length, um, and, and, and on and on. So he just, he, he mentions a, a, a mound prairie because it's a, a land survey, we know exactly that that was on, on the Quarter Prairie. That's 1840. He didn't make a map of the mounds, but he documents it. Look, oh, you're going to do this. So Daniel just mentioned Theodore Lewis um, and, and how he's going to play a role in the story. In the 1880s, Theodore Lewis was a mound surveyor. And for 15 years, from the 1880s to early 1890s, he, served, he mapped about 13,000 mounds in the Midwest. He walked on, on, on feet 10,000 miles to do this. He also took stages and trains and things like that, but he walked 10,000 miles and recorded 13,000 miles. Um, and, and he came to uh, Decorah Prairie in 1888. This is his map of the mounds at Decorah Prairie. And you can see these long tail, these are the lizard mounds, these underworld spirits that we now understand them to be. There's three bird mounds. One, 
two, and there's another one right there. Um, and uh, effigy mouths, and there's two more lizards, these linear mouths, these long cigar shaped things, and then there's a series of a line of conical mouths or small round mouths there, and some of those scattered about there. So that's that's the main part of the decor group mapped in 1888, uh, just before it started to become plowed. I did it. Um, so uh, uh, there's another, the, the mouse were next mapped in 1914 by George Squire, who was an antiquarian in Treffle. Um, and uh, this is Squire's map. By that time, the mounds in the plow. So here's that line of conicals. But you can see that the lizard mounds, which used to have arms and heads, are now just kind of tapered with like tadpoles. The birds distorted. Um, and many of the mounds are already gone. So it's, it's being damaged by 1914. Milwaukee Public Museum, Daniel mentioned, it came to trouble in 1928, excavated the Nichols Mound. Some of them also came to Decorah Prairie and mapped the mounds at that time. They actually could see some of the lizard or panther mounds or turtle mounds still in, in, intact. Uh, the bird, some of the linear mounds as well, with those, uh, most of those conicals that are now gone by that time. And then in 1944, Highway 53 was being planned to be built. Uh, to go right through this mound group. So a volunteer came up uh, from the Wisconsin Archaeological Society. He sketched what he could see. There were two mounds in the actual plot, right away, actually three mounds. This is the remnant of like the head of one of these guys. Uh, these are some of those linears and things like that. So the, and at that time, mounds were not protected. So the, the road building people, anybody, if you had a mound, you could tear it down, you could do anything you wanted to, they were all plowed away, or a lot of them plowed away. Mounds weren't protected in Wisconsin until 1985 when the state law was finally passed to protect the area mounds. Before that, lots, thousands of mounds were destroyed. 80% of the mounds in Wisconsin were obliterated by road construction, plowing, and, and such. Um, so they're pretty much going away here. By that time, uh, this is a, a modern area photograph of Google Earth. A photograph, and here's the bend in the road and the plowed fields. And if you drive by that, there's no evidence whatsoever of any of those mounds existing at all. It's just flat out there, okay? But there's this new technology called LIDAR, okay? So this is LIDAR, which is, which is laser area photography. You can wash away buildings and wash away the canopy, and you can see the ground surface. So here's, here's the bend in the road where those mounds used to be. And they're gone, there's nothing there. But with LIDAR, you can see we're discovering mounds that we never knew about before. So these are two conical mounds on the wooded points of the terrace overlooking the Black River we just found about three years ago. They're still there. So these weren't mapped originally. They're not part of that main group, but they're outliers of it. So there's still mounds uh, being discovered by this new technology, which is kind of cool. So now I'm going to turn to George Gale and his contributions to archaeology. Okay, now mention you know, obviously a very important figure for details right here, but he also dabbled in the antiquarian uh, records. And in 1867, wrote his classic book, um, Upper Mississippi, and that includes some, not some, some discussion of some of the archaeological resources in this area. There's also some in the early Gales with transcripts in the 1860s, I'll show you some uh, articles from him <clears throat> that are reports from him about mounds and things like that. I'm going to talk about Silver Mount. Uh, the, tr the Trumple platform models uh, and FT models, Gale's contributions to those. <clears throat> so Silver Mound, and you mentioned this before, Silver Mound is a 250-acre hill near the village of Hickston in Jackson County, Wisconsin, about 50 miles away. Um, it's, a, it's a place where it's sandstone, but that sandstone has become cemented to form this material called Hickston Silicified Sandstone. It was first in the first indications that there might be archaeology there would be cut by the general land office surveyors in the 1840s. They went up and over Silver Mound, and they recorded that that hill had a whole bunch of pits in it. They looked like mining pits, but they had no idea why there would be mining pits there, because it was kind of flint rock, it was a sandy flint rock. Um, and that was it, but it was a public record. That's the record that people used to buy the land to come here as a pioneer settlement. They, they raided the land for farming and timber and mill sites and things like that. So the people saw there were pits there. They just said, well, there's got to be a valuable mineral there. And so prospectors almost immediately in the 1850s came to Silver Mount and started digging, looking for silver. That's how it got its name. There's no silver at Silver Mount. <laughs> we know that because George Gale and another guy named David Webster went there and they verified this is sandstone. There's no metal here at all. 
And Gale was one of the first guys in 1860, this is the newspaper article, Gale's in 1860, he went to Silver Mount, and he records that there's these ancient pits, and they're probably, they, have, they were probably dug to, uh, what did I say, uh, from the bluff east of three quarters of the mile, saw many holes have been dug, many years since, evidently four arrowheads. He recognizes that they're digging, those pits were dug up, you get the stone to make the arrowheads. Uh, and they're ancient because the amount of dirt that's washed in and the size of the trees that are growing out of them. So that's Gale's first record of silver. We now know that Silver Mound was the place where Native Americans went to get stone to make stone tools from 13,000 years ago, Clovis points, to arrowheads 350 years ago, all the way through time. Uh, every year, people went to Silver Mound to get stone to make their stone tools. Knives, hide scrapers, projector points, it's, it was their monards, it was their hardware so where they had to go to make to get the material to stay alive. It's a crucial site in the Midwest. It's the best stone in Wisconsin to make stone tools. And there's pits all over, and it's still there. So this is a photograph of the snow sort of in those pits. Um, and uh, and with LIDAR, we were actually able to count the pits um, and, and see them better. And there's 1,200 remaining pits on Silver Mountain. Uh, this is a photograph, a larger photograph of one of the complexes in 400 miles, just in that complex, just to give you an idea. That pit is 50 feet across and 20 feet deep, and there's 400 of those right there. Huge amount of labor invested to dig into the ground to get that stone. Silver Mount was crucial for it. George Gale was the first guy to wrestle this First white guy. First white guy. Thank you. Thank My pleasure. You. Thank you. Um, <coughs> Um, so, so Gale was also, uh, uh, he also made a record of a platform mound in Trebo. This is from his 1870, uh, 1867 book, sorry. Um, and he wrote in there that the mound in Trump, this is a platform he's talking about. The mound in Trump was seven feet high, the level surface of the top, 25 by 50 feet, and it tapers off on the side. So it's a classic Mississippi mound. He didn't make a map of this one. didn't say where it was in Trebo. And George, I'm oh, sorry. Theodore Lewis in 1885 went to Trumbull looking for Gale's model. It was already published. He couldn't find it. And the reason he couldn't find it is because it's supposed to be seven feet tall. Well, a few years ago, somebody found, like a colleague of ours from Arcadia, found this newspaper article from the Winona paper. It says in 1879, there was some curious, curious, curiosity aroused last week in regard to an Indian mound between the residents of Mr. Ryder Schneider and Mr. Boers. Trevor, about four feet of the top of that mound had been removed to make for Roseville. Well, during the records, this is Ryan Schneider's house, the Brewer's house is right there. Today, if you go by there, there's a little bump in this yard. It's only three feet tall because it's the base of Gale's mound. So the original Gale's mound would have been up where this dash line is. The base of it's still there here, um, but that's the base of Gale's mound. Daniel and I actually we were able to excavate into that mound to verify this in 2014, I think. Um, and at the bottom of the, the mound, hi John, we found a plat we found the, the, the remains of a temple building that had been built before the mound was built. So they had a temple and they closed that temple and put the platform on top of that. On top of that platform would have been another temple or the, the residence of the Indian people on top. So again, Gail was one of the first people to record a Mississippian site in Trouble or part of it still there. All right, Gale College Mounts, here you go, ready? All right, uh, 1860, uh, Galesville newspaper. On the grounds of the Galesville University, we're here. 35 feet east of the building, right there, um, is a figure probably intended to represent a bear. So there's a bear around 35 feet from us right over here. There was, okay? Um, and then about 40 rods to the north, about rod 16.5 feet. So 40 rods is about 660 feet. Uh, to the north, there was a longer mound. Um, it resembles a horse, it's probably a deer or a long tailed panther type thing. Uh, that was 70 feet long. The road at that time uh, was already going through the neck, uh, wearing through the neck of it. Um, so, so that's the only record we have of the mounds on, on, on the campus. Here. But there it is. So there were two mounds here, never made a map of them. Uh, they're, uh, you know, you drive by, you can't see them right now, but the faces of them might still be. Right. Well, Lion. Lion? Lion will see the surface if it's a ball. 
Live on the scene of the ground. You can do ground penetrating radar um, and magnetometer. There's remote sensing that you can look into the ground. You could, you could scan that and see if there's a burial pit still on the ground. It's a possibility. Mm -hmm. Because they've been plowed, the miner probably won't pick up the. Yeah, yeah. Liner, liner is a surface thing. So if there's a bump, you see it. If it's fly spots. But the burial bed of the would may be detected. All right. Gale also talked about mounds on his property, which was a quarter mile south or a quarter mile south of Highway uh, 53. There's Gale's estate. This is from 1877. That there's his house. Uh, the records indicate that there was a group of mounds, 100 rods west of Gale, so that's 1,660 feet. And if you go west of where his house is, there's a, a branch of Beaver Creek coming up from there. That's probably where those mounds were. Um, and it talked about those mounds being, um, there was long-tailed quadrupeds and there was birds and there was a man mountain, the mound in the shape of a human being. This is, a, this is a clipping from 1860 that talks about Gale and Doctors Young and Johnson going there and excavating it and then their analysis of the bones. But it also says that those bones were pre preserved at the, at the Museum of the Upper Mississippi Historical Society in Galesville. I presume that was at Gales College. Virginia Gale's collection was here. And one of the reasons I think that is because in 1914, George Squire said, Judge Gale, of course, was working in a fine collection which was placed at Gale College, and unfortunately was destroyed to the burning of the building a number of years ago. You got a record of that? Yeah. Okay, well, you had a collection here that's, that got burned down. Um, and then he remembers it was unusually rich uh, and such pottery and all sorts of stuff. So, so Gale's collection, he had a collection on display here for a while. When was that fire? I'm not sure of the year, but it, the entire core of this building burned to the ground and they rebuilt what you see today. Okay, great. I think it was 1884. 1884, okay. And that would have been before this, okay. And Gale or Squire would have been alive in 1884. So I'm going to close my section um, talking about uh, some rock art in the area. So this is in George Gale, and his son appears here. So this is the, this is the rock shelter at High Cliff Park. I mean, you probably got a footbridge used to leave right to it. Um, you can still walk there uh, through the, the path today, but a spring comes right out of here. But this is a rock shelter. And Theodore Lewis, again, in 1884, came here, had a picture taken. This is a man pointing to the wall. And it says, uh, the rock shelter of Galesville, the sides of which are covered with carvings or pictographs representing two and four-legged animals, birds, men, snakes, etc. Okay? So that, that rock shelter was full of Native American rock art. Um, this is uh, George Gale's son. This is going from the archives online. Uh, but looking at the, uh, the rock shelter um, some years later. 1950, first professional archaeologist looking for rock art in Wisconsin, Robert Ritzenthal from the Milwaukee Public Museum, visited here at that time in 1947. There was one bird left that he could see. Uh, everything on the, on the walls. Um, but just to give you an idea of what it might have looked like, this is, this is Lewis's drawings from the Lamoya Rock Shelter. He actually drew those uh, across the Mississippi River from Trouble. And you have snakes, rattlesnakes, you've got a thunderbird, you've got humans, and you've got buffalo four legged animals, you've got a big fish, and there's long tail panthers and, and things like that as well. So that's, that may be what it used to look like. In Perot State Park, there was a cliff face um, that had carvings on it. This is Lewis's drawings of those, a series of giant hands and stuff. That was quarried away from wing dams in around 1903. Um, but we're still finding new rock art sites um, to this day. So this is a, this is a picture uh, from about five years ago of a deer. There's his neck coming down in his back and his legs coming down through there, uh, carved in a, a shelter up by uh, Arcadia uh, that we just came across about maybe almost eight years ago. Uh, so we're still finding the rock sites. So they're still out there, but a lot of them are already gone. Okay. Yeah, there, I'm going to turn it back to you. Hey, that's my library. That's your library, <laughs> yes. And we just wanted to point out that if you want to learn more about the archaeology of your area, there's a couple of places that you can go. And one is your local library where the J.O. Beadle collection is on display. This is J.O. Beadle. He was a longtime resident and school teacher in the area. Um, and he donated his collection to the library. This is his son looking at the collection, and I believe there's a cassette that you can get to actually listen 
to because he recorded information about his find. So and he had a cassette player, so you don't have to bring your own. <laughs> yes. Um, you can also go visit what we call the Tremolo Interpreter Path or Trip. There, if you haven't hiked, has anybody hiked up Little Buck Mountains Trail in Tremolo? Great. So um, you can hike up. There's a kiosk at the base of the Highway 35 with some interpretive signs, free parking, um, and a trail that leads to the tip of Little Bluff with a series of interpretive signs that kind of talks about the archaeology of that area. There's a small exhibit in Grove State Park and then a small exhibit at the Trumbull Library as well. Um, and then if you're also interested, we, we have a bunch of books that we've written about the archaeology of this area that we can talk about as well. But we are, that's the end of our presentation. We're happy to take any questions that you might have. And we hope that we have given you a little glimpse of the amazing archaeology we have in this area. It really is fascinating, and it's really unique and special. Um, and so we're happy to be here with you today to tell you about it for Foundry Day. Yes? Well, I appreciate the, the history lesson, because I just literally got on the county board, so it's good to know the history of the very county that I'm serving on. That's great. Especially because I know Gil is also one of the founders of Trump County, so it's, no, it's good to know my forefathers, so yeah. so, my founding fathers, but it's been just in time. So, appreciate Excellent. it. Excellent. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, I have a question. Um, how do they make the arrowheads? How do they make the arrowheads? That's an awesome question. Um, you want to take that one? Sure. I can give you a technical. <laughs> we'll have them back sometime to show us how to do it. Yeah. Well, we can do that. It's called flint napping. And it's, you, take, you have to have the right kind of stone and you, you chip it. So you knock, knock little pieces off that are called flakes. And then what you're left with is, is the arrow. And you just, you just shape it by chipping it down into the, you know, into the shape of the arrow. And you have to put some notches in and things like that. It's called flint napping. It's pretty cool. Yeah. You need band-aids. <laughs> <laughs> It, it, it yeah. Yeah. yeah, so we would be happy to see, look at those and, and maybe tell you how old it is. We if work a lot with, with collectors in the area that have artifacts from their family farms and help them try to figure out how old they are. So that's really cool that you have that. Did yeah. they have something that was harder than flint to do that? Or was it flint on flint? So if, no, if law. The, the stone that they're using to actually chip so it's flint stone, and then the hammer stones are like basalt. Um, so the first stage is they're using like the basalt. It, it's called the hammer stone because it, it's a round stone that fits really nicely into your hand. Um, and then they move from that to another kind of method that they use an antler baton. So it's a hard hammer percussion, we call it, and then the antler baton is a little softer. So then you can kind of take smaller um, chips off and, and, and get a little more refined um, shape of the point, and then the last step is actually take the time of the antler, and then they use that to actually push the place off to get the notches and things like that. So it's soft. Yes. Uh, my mother who grew up on Decora Prairie, and she just died a couple years ago at age 96. Said she remembered some of those mounds apparently before they changed the road, but she said in the spring. Uh, when the snow was starting to melt, it was pretty easy to see them because they were a little higher. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Some of the best mound <laughs> photography is in the winter, actually, because it kind of helps to bring out the, the three-dimensional nature of the mound. Every, every now and then, if you look at old area photographs, they go back to the 1930s. <coughs> The state was photographed in 1939, about, um, and and, uh, and there's a series of photographs since then. So you can you take the Cora Prairie and look at the photographs some time, and if the conditions are just right with the moisture and the and the crop cover just right, sometimes you can see the shadows of mound stains in the, in those fields. It happens once in a great while. And uh, just one other question. I, I probably asked this before, but how did they get the perspective? It wasn't like they had a drone up there so they could see that, you know, this tail needs to be moved over a little bit. That's a great question. Because they do look like they're meant to be seen from above. They, and, well, yeah. And, and especially the way that they're oriented. A lot of times you see, like, birds oriented off the edges of, you know, higher bank.
things kind of like they're flying off the edge over the water. So, yeah, I mean, I, they're just there are, master engineers. There, there are mounds that are a quarter of a mile long. You know, and, and you, when you look at them down below, it's just you can see that it's a shape of something. You, know, you don't really get the perspective. You almost need to be up above it. It's just. You know. <laughs> any other questions? Have you done any work near um, the bridge going to an uh, wash site or whatever the, the construction? Uh, my mother grew up on the farm right at the top of the hill, and there were people there in the back field looking for Mom said they were arrowheads all over, but she was hit. They were nothing. They didn't pick them up and take them. Up, up at both side? This side of side. This side of On this side of the Trumpler River. Oh, okay. I'm wondering if you did any work on the Duff now Preso farm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's fine. Yeah. 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 I'd like to know about that. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. So, yeah, that, it's right on the side where you cross over the Trumple River and Marshall and right. the other side sort of thing. And that's, yeah, Pat's Farm is full of stuff. It's on the point where that river comes into the Mississippi bottoms, kind of, you know, opens up. Um, and I actually did an excavation um, on the upper field and, yeah. and okay. we stripped off some, we did some trenching and there was, there was late, there was a late wooden village there. Um, that, you know, there's post holes and pieces of pottery from that period of time too. And there were mounds, there's still some mounds on, along the old railroad grade, bike trail down below, uh, but there, but just between, between there and the Wisconsin Bluff line, there's like this bowl uh, that, that where the fields are. And that the GLO guys talked about hundreds of that fields in that bowl. So Pat's farm is right in a concentration of FG Mountain Road. Wow. My grandpa built that house. Oh, he did? Well, he built the second story. He built the bottom part down on logs from sure. that yeah. for a road. They yeah. <laughs> lived in during the day. <laughs> then they went to school during the day and they broke it there. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Imagine he had a big collection. Plowed by horses. I imagine your grandfather had a big collection. Yes, oh yes, yes. Alright, any other questions? Otherwise, I think strawberries are sounding pretty good. Yeah, we got strawberry <laughs> shortcakes, dirt, and worms, but let's give these guys a round of applause. <laughs>